I am going to introduce Kevin and then we'll get going with him and then, then I'll be the talk after. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if anybody's left, that's whatever. All right, so I'll introduce Kevin. Dr. Ke uh, Kevin Miller is a full-time professor in athletic training program at Central Michigan University. His research interests include the causes, treatments, and prevention of exertional heat illness with a specific emphasis on exercise-associated muscle cramp, cramping and exertional heat stroke. He has published 65 peer-reviewed manuscripts in medical journals and presented over 100 international international, national, or regional presentations on topics related to heat illnesses. He has co-authored several national and international position statements, including the 2015 NATA position statement on exertional heat illness, the, uh, the statement of the Third International Exercise Association Hyponutremia Consensus Development Conference, thanks Kevin, and the National Roundtable on Malignant Hy um, hypothermia in physically active populations. He serves as an associated editor, associate editor for the Journal of Athletic Training and is a member of the Corey Stringer Institute Medical and Science Advisory Board and the NATA's Convention Program Committee and former student of mine kind of, so I appreciate him very much. Here we go, Kevin. Thanks everybody, this is a, a lot like coming home for me. So I did my PhD at BYU, uh, Google Cougs, and uh, my first talk ever was at RMATA in 2006. And so I'm, I'm glad to be back with all of you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. A big thank you to the RMATA uh, committee for putting this conference on. Can we give Alyssa a round of applause and all of her work and her team's effort? Do we, have a, do we have a mouse that I can maybe use? There we go, I think that's me, cool. Uh, so the BOC always wants speakers to disclose any potential conflicts of interest, so I'm happy to report that in this presentation, there are zero private interests that I think are going to confound any of the research studies that I'm gonna talk about. And this is usually where I say, if you own a private company and you would like to invest in research that I can do for you, uh, please talk to me after. Um, but in this, presentation, I'm hoping what I can give you is my unbiased opinion on what hyponatremia is and how we can best prevent it and how it is associated with exercise-associated muscle cramps. So you're going to see two things whenever I talk about a research study on the screen here. You're going to see these colorful boxes and there's going to be an arrow next to the box and those boxes correspond to this chart and this is the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine chart which is a way to try and quantify the strength of research. And so what you would like to see anytime I talk about a research study is a number closer to one. That would be the strongest type of evidence. Things like your randomized controlled clinical trials, your systematic reviews of RCTs, that kind of thing. Whereas the weaker evidence is like your level five, things like anecdote, mechanism-based reasoning, animal research studies, that type of thing. The other thing that you're gonna see is a Pedro checklist Just slow, it's not as fast as I talk. The uh, Pedro checklist is a 11 point checklist that's scored out of 10. And again, this is a way to try and quantify how good the research studies are. And so what you would like to see on my slides is anytime I'm talking about a research study, a higher number as it pertains to the Pedro checklist. Again, just a way to try and assess whether or not the research is good research or not so great research. I'll wink at you when I want to advance this. <laughs> we'll have to come up with a faster system. Um, so what is hyponatremia? Well, we have symptomatic and asymptomatic hyponatremia. And so the symptomatic variety are the athletes that actually show symptoms, obviously, things like the confusion and the nausea, maybe vomiting. Whereas your asymptomatic athletes, you would not know that they were hyponatremic without a uh, blood analyzer telling you how much sodium was in their blood. And so traditionally, this is a laboratory-based clinical criteria where your blood sodium has to be less than 135 millimoles per liter to meet the 
diagnosis of hyponatremia. And again, we don't usually have that as athletic trainers unless you're working for like a Boston Marathon or a Chicago Marathon where they have these analyzers in their med tents. So oftentimes what we do is we go off of the clinical representation of the symptoms, right? And that can be anything that really looks like concussion, confusion, irritability, headache, fatigue, lightheadedness, those types of things. And so if you attended any of the rectal temp assessment labs, first off, thank you. <laughs> and second off, that is another condition that mimics these signs and symptoms. And so when we talk about exertional heat stroke, we need other criteria, in that case, rectal temperature, to clinically differentiate these life-threatening conditions. I'm gonna skip that slide. That slide was trying to show you uh, phantom running, but unfortunately the video doesn't work. It's an athlete who is semi-conscious, but his legs are still running. And so it's, again, it's a brain condition caused by the hyponatremia. And so even though he's barely conscious, his legs think he still needs to be running. Um, really cool video. Sorry, I can't show you. Okay, risk factors for hyponatremia. By far, the biggest two are over-drinking. So the athletes that develop hyponatremia are typically your long-distance endurance runners. They typically are very slow when they run the race and they stop at every fluid station and they drink at every fluid station even though they might not need the fluid. And so these are the athletes that actually gain weight after a long distance marathon. And so those are the people most at risk of hyponatremia. However, in recent years, we're also seeing hyponatremia creep into our team-based sports. In fact, in 2014, we had two healthy high school football players die by overconsumption of fluids because they were trying to prevent muscle cramping. We'll talk about those guys in a second. But some other risk factors there, again, long duration exercise, slow pace, those types of things. And so, oh, sorry, I'm gonna come back here if I can. It's kind of like my daughter trying to use the magic wand at Universal Studios Harry Potter land. Um, one of the dangerous things that I see every summer is uh, sports medicine programs or athletes posting this picture like you see right here with the times on the water jug, right? 8 a.m., I got a drink to this point, 9 a.m., this point, 10 a.m. That is super dangerous practice because that is forcing people to consume fluids based on a schedule rather than physiological need. And so I have tested athletes who do not need to consume more than a liter of fluid per hour, whereas I have had athletes who would need to consume over three liters per hour because their sweat rates are that variable. One of the highest sweat rates that I've personally recorded was in a female soccer player who was five foot five, 120 pounds, and she lost more sweat per hour than most of our linemen on our football team. Just standing there, she looked damp. <laughs> So you can't just look at somebody and say, oh, you need to have this much fluid consumed by this time. That is a dangerous recipe for hyponatremia. So the pathophysiology, again, two really different ways you can get hyponatremia. One, we can either add more water into your blood. That would be like the hypervolemic hyponatremia where people are gaining weight. Or you can lose so much sodium from your sweat that you dilute your sodium concentration in your blood that way. Unfortunately, in both cases, what ends up happening is your brain becomes more salty than your blood. And if you remember basic chemistry or chemistry, water follows salt. And so water goes into the brain. The brain doesn't have a lot of room to expand. And so intracranial pressure increases. A portion of the brain stem breaks off. And now your athlete can no longer control their respirations or their heart rate and they pass away. That's how hyponatremia kills athletes. And so both cases are a recipe for disaster, but in the most cases, for most deaths, it's the weight gain in athletes from drinking too much fluid. So what do we do? Treatment-wise, the treatment is fairly simple. We gotta increase sodium or we have to remove water from the blood and it's by far easier to give people hypertonic saline. Uh, at the Boston Marathon, they also give uh, chicken bouillon cubes as a way to try and increase sodium in the diet. But anytime you go through the stomach, it takes a while for that to be digested, released into the small intestines, absorbed into your bloodstream. Whereas if you give somebody a hypertonic saline solution, now they have that sodium concentration increase almost immediately, and you can prevent that fluid transfer from the blood into the brain. 
As far as a prevention strategy, you have to educate your athletes. It really comes back to educating them on what is a proper hydration and rehydration strategy. And so if you don't know the sweat rate of your athlete, by far the easiest thing you can tell them is just to drink when you're thirsty. Our thirst mechanism does not kick on until we are about 2% hypohydrated. And so if your athletes are describing to you that they are thirsty, then unless there is smog in the air or coal dust or something else that confounds our mouth sensation, then thirst is telling you you need fluid. Where we get into very dangerous guidelines is when we tell people you have to exactly replace the fluid that you lose during exercise. Some of the most successful athletes, the ones that win the Boston Marathon, Chicago Marathon, Twin Cities Marathons, are the ones who lose the most water and are most dehydrated. And so remember, if you're concerned about like exertional heat stroke, exertional heat stroke is not caused by dehydration. Exertional heat stroke is caused by exercise intensity higher than what a person is capable of performing. And then you have other factors being how hot is it outside and those types of things. But by far, drink when you're thirsty is a safe solution that you can advocate to your athletes to ensure that they don't overconsume fluids and then cause hyponatremia. Now, if you wanna take it one step farther, sweat test them. Get a scale, measure their body weight before practice, measure their body weight after practice. You have to do a little bit of adjustment with math if they consume fluids or if they pee during the practice, but assuming they don't do that, it's a very simple subtraction equation. So where does cramping come into play? Well, exercise-associated muscle cramping, these are painful involuntary contractions of skeletal muscle either during or after exercise. And I don't know if I can play videos with this, with this thing. So as you can clearly see oh. in this nighttime video of... Oh my God, <laughs> I won't stop. So, so here you kind of see the, the cramp kind of spread in the gastroc, and cramps tend to kind of anything. migrate. <laughs> And the audio is fantastic. God. Oh my God. Painful, involuntary skeletal <laughs> muscle contraction during or shortly after exercise. Oh my God. We can move on. <laughs> Before the swearing this? starts. <laughs> and, I'm sorry? That, that is not my leg, no. Um, and so we, we see kind of confusing messages sometimes when we watch TV or movies or we see commercials and you see statements like this, like dehydration, the silent killer. I'm like, really? Like, who is dehydration killing? How many of you have had an athlete die of dehydration? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Dehydration doesn't kill athletes. You know what, Dehydra when dehydration kills somebody, it's because the person can't physically find water. These are people who are lost in the desert or they go hiking in the Grand Canyon and they don't bring fluid with them and they physically can't find fresh water to drink. That's where dehydration kills people. That's not our case though, is it? We have student athletic trainers, we ourselves walk around our athletes providing water if they need it, but even if you have a psycho coach that fluid restricts, restricts athletes and is not um, normal about performance enhancement by hydration, which can happen, sooner or later that practice is gonna be over, right? And they're gonna stumble in the locker room, they're gonna go home to their dorm or their apartment, they're gonna drink like a camel, most likely, but they will find water, right? Dehydration is not going to kill any of our athletes. And in fact, our society has gotten to the point where we carry water around with us. How many of you have water bottles in your backpacks right now? <laughs> right. We treat dehydration like it's this big scary monster that might sneak up behind us and club us over the head at any given time. Now, please hear me. I'm not advocating that we don't use water bottles because there's a health and hygiene issue. Children, by far, we know public safety-wise are underhydrated people, athletes. 70% of athletes will show up to practice dehydrated. We know all this. So from a sociocultural standpoint, having water easily available in your backpack, great. We know people will be better hydrated, but is it gonna kill you? No, no it's not. Anybody have trivia crack on their phone? 
Me too. So if you're unfamiliar with Trivia Crack, this is like a Trivial Pursuit type game where the user submits the questions. And this came up on my wife's Trivia Crack a few years ago. It says, to prevent cramps after a workout, you can drink a sports drink. Don't you appreciate it when your, uh, your games on your phone provide medical advice? I know I do. Which of the contents in sports drinks help prevent cramps? Vitamin C, iron, salts, or vitamin D? And the correct answer was salts. Interesting. Well, let's look at the data eventually. First, we're going to play this other hydration message that comes across to kids. And we're going to need audio maybe a little bit louder. You ever wonder how SpongeBob lives in the ocean and yet he still drinks fluid? <laughs> right? Anyway. Uh, so here's some more confusing hydration messages again for kids. This is a. Uh, If you are in this room right now and you don't recognize either of those clips, you don't have an 11-year-old girl at home. Um, but I do. And so water, water, you've got to drink a lot more water than you think. Wow. What a powerful message. Again, I understand what they're trying to say given that kids are chronically dehydrated. I get that. But when did we evolve as a society to think that we have to replace every single little bit of water that we lose during exercise. I'm here to tell you that that kind of philosophy and that mentality is just not safe. And so you see other messaging like this. And again, I'm not trying to pick on any kind of company or anything like that. I'm not against sports drinks or Gatorade. I am against bad marketing. So this came across my Facebook feed one day. Propel water. You put in the work, propel water puts in the electrolytes. Cool. So I went to their website, and their website says, when you sweat, you lose more than just water. That's true. You lose important electrolytes like salt and potassium that are important for keeping your body properly hydrated. Propels the only water with enough electrolytes to put back what you lose in sweat. Now here's the funny bit about living in the United States. We have nutrition labels on all products for food. And so you and I can do very easy math. And so one of the cool things about me is I collect sports drinks. Yeah. I tricked somebody into marrying me. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to show you a picture of my office here in a second where I collect sports drinks. So anytime I go anywhere around the world or across the country, I always collect sports drinks from that country because I think it's so fascinating. And so here's the nutrition label for Propel. It has 0.45 grams of sodium per liter in it. And so that is not even close to replacing what a normal athlete loses during exercise when it comes to their sodium losses. And I'll show you the math here even more in a second. So you gotta be careful when you buy products. So what do athletic trainers think about cramping? Well, if we asked most people in this room, nine out of 10 of us would probably say that dehydration or electrolyte imbalance causes cramping. If we asked how is the best way to prevent it, most of us would say hydration. And yet, 50% of people when surveyed said they were very successful treating cramping. And so there's a disconnect. If cramping is so obviously due to dehydration, then the treatment is simple. It's hydration, right? And yet, we have a lot of athletic trainers who say we're not very successful treating this condition. And so when we ask athletes, what do you think causes cramping? Well, we get very similar responses that a lot of athletes believe that cramping is due to sweating, thirst, as the primary indicators of something that occurs before muscle cramping. So 88% would agree with that kind of statement. We also know from other research of athletes that most athletes are not using scientific information or athletic trainers to learn the best way to fully rehydrate or drink during exercise. Instead, they use trial and error. Well, that works great 
unless you kill yourself from hyponatremia the first time. A lot of other athletes will ask their friends for advice on what they do. Uh, thankfully, not a lot of athletes are using marketing or commercials to guide their hydration strategies, so that's good. But we are using a lot of non-scientific, non-peer-reviewed type information to guide our drinking behaviors in our athletes. Other information that we see, again, personal experience seems to be the predictor for how people rehydrate and come up with strategies for races. Now, the link between hyponatremia and cramping, as I mentioned, in 2014, we lost two healthy high school American football players, and the common thread with both of them is they were trying to prevent cramping. Now, can you see the bad uh, mentality here? If you believe cramps are due to dehydration, then the cure is hydration. So you get a cramp during the third quarter of a football game. Well, you must be dehydrated. Thank you. This is the interactive part of our program. And so now the third quarter continues on a little bit more, and you get another cramp. Has this ever happened to anybody? All the time, right? And so the, the thought process is, well, I must still be dehydrated. You get it. So you drink even more fluid because maybe if I drink a little more fluid, I won't get a cramp again in the fourth quarter. And that's what happened to Walker Wilbanks. That's what happened to Zyrese Oliver. And in Zyrese Oliver's case, we think he consumed about four gallons of sports drink and water. And he was vomiting clear fluids in the coach's office before they finally decided to call 911. And unfortunately, he passed away later that night. But again, the common thread is trying to prevent cramping. <laughs> there we go. All right, so let's look at the evidence. So the dehydration theory for cramping is oftentimes purported like this. And so our athletes exercise. They lose sodium in their sweat. They lose water in their sweat. And that causes a contraction of the interstitial fluid space. If you remember your exercise physiology, that's the space surrounding the muscle fibers, right? So fluid moves in and outside of our vasculature, outside of our muscles, and it just passes back and forth. And so the thinking goes, well, when we sweat, we get a contracture of that interstitial fluid space, and then what happens is, that's actually supported by data, we do, <laughs> I, I promise you this animation flows a lot <laughs> better, uh, so as we lose that fluid from the interstitial space, the pressure increases in our interstitial fluid compartment. Select, quote unquote, nerve terminals then become hyperexcitable, and as a result, then we get muscle cramps. And the first two bits of that, or I should say, just the first bit of that is actually scientifically supported. When our athletes sweat, we lose a good deal of fluid from our interstitial fluid space, but the rest of those bullet points are all conjecture. And so let's look at the evidence that's typically presented as support for this dehydration hypothesis. And so this is sweat rates from 17 uh, semi-professional crampers or semi-professional tennis players. <laughs> <laughs> they all did have a, a personal history of muscle cramping in the past. And so if you look at the sweat rates for these tennis players, 2.6 liters per hour, that is a large sweat rate. And tennis matches typically will last anywhere from three to four hours. And so if you look at the sodium losses, these guys are losing 2.7 grams per hour of sodium. Now, the USDA says the average adult needs to consume two grams of sodium per day. These guys are losing 2.7 grams per hour. And again, typical tennis match lasts four hours. And so you're losing... Oh, now you're getting too excited. <laughs> I'll just put this down. Uh, so they're losing a lot of fluid, they're losing a lot of sodium, and yet, despite losing 10 grams of sodium and losing significant amounts of fluid, nobody cramped on the day these data were collected. Uh, Stofan et al. So this was the uh, Sweaty Sooner study, if you've ever heard of this study. This was a Gatorade-funded study uh, back in 2004 is when they did the data collection. They published it in 2005. Again, looking at people with a history of cramping versus people without a history of cramping. And so these athletes were people who needed medical attention, people who required IVs, people who came up to the doctors and said, I keep cramping, I can't stop. Does that describe every cramper that you've seen? I have a lot of athletes that cramp, stretch themselves, and never tell me 
that they cramped. I don't know about you. How many of you have filled out a soap note for an athlete every time they cramped? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> right? And so here we have evidence of crampers losing large amounts of fluid. Again, 3.8 liters or 1.5 liters an hour versus our athletes without a history of cramping losing sometimes less fluid. But statistically, there's no difference between those two different groups. When we look at the sodium losses, again, these authors would tell you, oh yeah, the cramping is because the, the cramp group is losing more sodium in their sweat than the non-cramp group. For example, in the morning practice, those crampers lost double the amount of sodium in their sweat as the non-crampers. So therefore, cramps must be due to sodium in sweat, the salty sweater phenomenon, right? Well, the problem is, one, there was no statistical difference, but they want to talk about it like it was. But even when these crampers, and I put crampers in quotes because nobody cramped on that day either, despite losing 10 grams of sodium from their sweat that day. So there's a disconnect. So here's the problem. Uh, before 2020, all of the literature combined when you look at the question of do people with a history of cramping lose more sodium in their sweat compared to non-crampers, that statement is based on 29 people in all of recorded history, 17 of which I showed you were the tennis players, the other 12 were football players, all men, two sports. Sound like a problem? Yeah, that's a problem. But even when you average all the data, the difference between those two groups is 540 milliliters, which if you're looking at your water bottle right now, that's around three to 400 milliliters of fluid. We're not talking about a huge amount of fluid here between the two groups. And so let's talk about the evidence against this theory. So prior to 2010, this is actually some of my doctoral dissertation work. Uh, the the problem with the cramp literature at the time was nobody separated dehydration from fatigue. So what we did is we dehydrated people, but we left a leg completely unexercised and left the muscles alone. We didn't have them exercise at all. Again, trying to separate the effects of dehydration from fatigue, recognizing that dehydration is a systemic response. So we dehydrated people, 3% of their body weight reduction. So that would be mild dehydration. They lost about 15% of their plasma volume. And then we induced muscle cramps in a completely rested, unexercised muscle. And we measured this thing called threshold frequency, which is the number of electrical stimuli it takes for your muscle to cramp. So the idea being, if your body is more susceptible to cramping, it's going to require fewer electrical stimuli to cramp. Therefore, if the number goes down, you are more susceptible to cramping. If the number goes up, you are less susceptible to cramping. But when you dehydrate people 3% and you separate the effects of fatigue, no differences there in cramp threshold frequency. And people attacked the study and they said, well, yeah, but that's mild dehydration. Have you seen my hogs after a football practice? Fair enough. So we did another study. This time this was done with my uh, master's student at the time. We severely dehydrated people, this time to four liters of sweat loss, which was approximately 5% body mass reduction. I can tell you these people looked like death. Like we put them in a 100 degree room with a sweat shirt on, sweat pants on. They lost so much water. They were so thirsty. And then we shocked them. <laughs> $50 can go a long way, students, right? Am I right, students? Uh, again, we measured this thing called cramp threshold frequency. And again, we noticed that there were no significant differences between uh, fluid states. So we shock them when they were hydrated, we shock them again when they were 5% or severely dehydrated. Again, we notice no differences in cramp susceptibility. And again, separating the effects of fatigue from dehydration. And we aren't the only people to do this. Uh, there have been studies in marathon runners, triathletes, that showed, again, crampers, the people who actually cramp during the marathon do not lose more body weight than the people who did not cramp during the marathon. And this has been showed with body weight change. Again, another study, no differences. Another study, no change in body mass loss. Here again, we have the second Gatorade-funded study in football players. Again, the Gatorade folks, great scientists, great people. Again, not trying to pick on Gatorade. No differences there in body mass reduction. 
Here again is our first Gatorade funded study. Again, we look at do they lose more body weight? And even in the Gatorade funded study, we seems like they lose more body weight in the morning practice, but again, afternoon practices, no difference there statistically, even in the morning practice. When we look at plasma volume changes, so the amount of water in your blood, in people who actually cramp versus those that don't. This was done by Ron Mon, who is a UK scientist. When they looked at marathon runners, no differences in plasma volume or blood volume between the two different cohorts. When we look again at marathon runners or long distance runners, plasma volume change is very similar between the people who actually cramp and the ones that don't. Do you see a pattern here? <laughs> When we take a look at, again, the dehydration theory, saying the interstitial fluid space contracts, that's true. We lose a lot of fluid from the interstitial fluid space. But those folks will oftentimes point to this research study to support that fact. And Dave Costell showed that when you dehydrate people, even to 6% body mass reduction, yes, you do lose a lot of blood volume, you do lose a lot of fluid, but Dr. Costell also did something else that was very interesting. They took blood samples and muscle biopsies. When you have muscle biopsies and blood samples, you know exactly how much the electrolyte concentrations are, and you can calculate the resting membrane potential of that muscle, meaning if dehydration actually caused an increase in excitability of the muscle, we would see a change in resting membrane potential. But guess what Dr. Costell found? No differences in resting membrane potential. In fact, it was actually harder with 6% dehydration to contract that muscle, not easier. And so again, for all the students in the room, just because somebody references a statement does not, believe, does not mean that you should believe it. It means do your own research, read the article for yourself, and then make up your own mind. Same thing with me. Don't take my word as gospel because I get a microphone all of these slides are referenced for you, so you can go back and look at the data for yourself. So if we look at the limitations of this theory, first, there's an absence of control subjects in many of these studies. Oftentimes, people don't cramp. How crazy is it you publish an article about cramping, but nobody in your study actually got the phenomenon you were trying to study? Very crazy, right? That'd be very insane to try and talk about cramping when nobody cramped in your study. When we do exercise studies, lots of things happen during exercise besides dehydration. Dehydration is a systemic anomaly, so is fatigue. It's hard to separate the two. And so there's lots of other things that happen during exercise besides just fluid loss. So for an author to say, well, it was the dehydration or it was the fatigue, really depends on your bias when you look at the data. All right, there's lots of things going on besides just those two things. Other problems, well, I told you it was based on 29 men that supported that theory, and so sweat sodium and sweat electrolytes are wildly variable, anywhere from 10 millimoles per liter to 100 millimoles per liter. And so when you have something that wide ranging, you can't base your findings off of just a small sample size, like 29 people from the same gender. That's just not good science. And again, in these studies, no control group, no comparison group, very small sample sizes, very hard to make clinical decisions. And so we came along <laughs> and we did the largest prospective cohort study of athletes in division one setting with a history of cramping versus those who said to us they had never had a cramp before in their lifetime. And rather than look at one sport and one gender, we looked at 11 sports both men and women, and we wanted to determine whether or not people with a history of cramping actually do lose more sweat and lose more electrolytes in their sweat. And when you take a larger sample size, guess what? No differences in sweat rate for men, no differences in sweat rate for women, no differences in sweat electrolyte concentrations. The women had a little weird potassium thing, but if you look at that effect size, it's very, very small. No differences here in sweat characteristics. Now, when we look at predictive ability and odds ratios and all the fun stuff everybody likes to talk about with evidence-based medicine courses, right? When you take a look at the predictability of these sweat characteristics and you take out American football, there are no significant differences there. Meaning, if you were to hand me a sweat sample and you said, Kevin, could you tell me if this was a cramp or not, and they don't play football, I can't tell you the difference just by looking at their sweat. However, 
if you look at football and our data, sweat rate and sweat electrolyte concentrations actually do become predictive of who is and who is not a cramper. So in 10 out of 11 sports, knowing sweat characteristics does not help you identify cramping. But in American football, it does seem to be predictive. Other problems. Again, we have limited control a lot of times in these field research studies. And so things like diet, exercise intensity, exercise duration, how hot is it outside, all of those things affect sweating. And so even in my study, that was a field study. All the Gatorade studies, those are field studies. You can't control for a lot of these types of things like diet and hydration status and those types of things. And so there are lots of limitations to these types of field studies. And again, there's no evidence for an increase in interstitial fluid pressure. In fact, in animals, this is actually data from dogs, when you severely dehydrate a dog and take a look at their interstitial fluid pressure, their pressure goes down with severe dehydration, not up. So again, very contrary to what the dehydration theory would tell you. So the problems with field studies, even mine. Exercise intensity is oftentimes not controlled, diet's not controlled, environment's not controlled, initial hydration status is not controlled. So wouldn't it be really awesome if somebody had a 10 by 10 by 10 environmental chamber in the state of Michigan and controlled for all of that stuff for you and then looked at sweat characteristics between athletes with and without a history of muscle cramping? That would be pretty awesome. <laughs> I think you know where I'm going with this. So we did a study, and that was it. <laughs> Go back. So sweat rate, no different. Sweat concentration for sodium, potassium, chloride, no differences between those with a history of cramping and those without, except we controlled for diet. We controlled for initial hydration status. The heat chamber was the same temperature. The treadmill was the same speed. They ran for the same duration. We controlled for as many things that affect sweat as possible. And again, we found no significant differences in sweat characteristics in athletes with and without a history of muscle cramping. What, no applause? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you don't have to applaud that. So even if we forget all of that, even if you're like, la, 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 don't want to listen to that, let's take a look at some fun examples. So the NATA... Uh, position statement says you have to drink more fluid than what you lose. That is absolutely true because as your athletes start drinking a lot of water, 30 minutes later, what do they got to do? Pee, right? That's fluid loss that you got to replace. That's why you got to drink more than what you lost during exercise. And so if we follow the NATA suggestions, which is a great idea, and we know how much sweat sodium people lose, and we know how long they exercise for, we can do very simple math to try and figure out what do we need to do to replace these things. So if we use Dr. Bergeron's cramp-prone tennis players that I showed you before, we can calculate how much Gatorade or any other fluid they need to drink. And so based on the fluid that they lost, because they drank some fluid while they were competing and playing tennis, they only had to consume about five to six liters of fluid to fully replace their fluid loss. Okay, that's doable. But what about Propel being the only sports drink that can replace the electrolytes you lost during exercise. Well, this is where this gets fun because that's the nutrition label for Gatorade. And again, please hear me. I am not anti-Gatorade. The scientists at Gatorade are fantastic people that do great work. But you got to remember they're trying to sell you a product. And so if we take a look at the sodium concentration in Gatorade, and if we take a look at the sodium concentration in sweat, and we multiply that by how long exercise was, we get eight grams of sodium that you have to replace. And so knowing how much sodium is in Gatorade, we can do some simple division. You've got to drink five gallons of Gatorade, which looks like this. Can you imagine lining up all 18 liters of Gatorade in front of your athlete saying, drink up, Johnny? That is horribly unsafe. And you will cause hyponatremia if you do that. <laughs> this is the only appropriate way to deliver that much fluid to an athlete. When the bubbles stop, that's when you really run out into a problem. 
And so why is that? Well, sports drinks, Gatorade, Powerade, Staminade, Hogwash, all of the body armor in the world is all considered hypotonic, not isotonic as this grocery store would make you believe, meaning there is more water in all of these sports drinks than there is sodium. And so to replace the amount of sodium that you lose, you have to drink a large volume of these sports drinks to replace what you lost. And so here's how cool my office is. I have lots of sports drinks in my office. These are just some of them. Again, still made somebody marry me. Made? I mean, asked. <laughs> Not like I tied her to a pole and forced her. Anyway, enough about me. So that's body armor. You would have to drink 45 gallons of body armor, 10 gallons of hogwash. I got that from NATA one year, by the way. A game, six gallons. Staminade, that's from Australia, 10 gallons. 12 gallons of Powerade, 30 gallons of life water, three gallons of carbohydrate energy Gatorade, six gallons of carbohydrate endurance formula, three gallons of a different variety of Gatorade, six gallons of G2, and the granddaddy of them all, you would have to consume 133 gallons of Propel to replace the amount of sodium these crampers in tennis lost. And there is only one way to deliver that much fluid. <laughs> and that's with the Camelback. Coming soon to a Dick's Sporting Goods near you. Now, in fairness to Propel, they came out with a new recipe that had more sodium in it, but you still have to drink five gallons of it, which is still very dangerous. So what? The cause of cramping is likely multifactorial. We like to draw these nice cartoons where one arrow and box lead to a next arrow and box, which leads to a next arrow and box, and it's not that simple. But please, if you take nothing away from anything else I've said today, understand that dehydration is not gonna kill your athlete, quite the opposite. Dehydration means your athletes need fluid. If you are trying to prevent hyponatremia, what you need to tell them is drink when you're thirsty. Now, the problem with drink when you're thirsty is thirst turns off at 2% dehydration, which means your athlete will not fully rehydrate if you have them rehydrate to thirst, which is why knowing your sweat rate and how much body mass you lose during exercise is important for rehydration. But if you are exercising during a football practice, it is much safer to tell your athletes, drink if you're thirsty, and then we'll catch you up with dinner afterwards rather than try and push sports drinks on you or add salt to your Gatorade or that kind of thing. In the typical American diet, I do not worry about sodium, right? Doritos, prepackaged food, processed food, that's sodium, folks. I almost never worry about my athletes getting enough sodium in their diets. And the ones that do sweat out a lot of sodium, okay, they we might keep an eye on, but in the typical American diet that our collegiate athletes and high school athletes are taking in, you don't need to worry about sodium replacement. But we have to educate people about what causes cramping, and it's probably not just dehydration from a fluid perspective. Now, I think dehydration does contribute to cramp genesis because I think dehydration causes people to fatigue much more quickly. And I believe there is much more evidence to suggest that cramping is caused by changes in the central nervous system rather than an increase in pressure in the interstitial fluid space and those types of things. And so this was a, a theory proposed by Martin Schwellness out of Cape Town, South Africa a few years ago. Again, the focus primarily is on muscle fatigue. The muscle fatigue theory is not perfect either. LeBron James developed cramping in the 2014 NBA Finals. You remember this, when the air conditioner conveniently was broken in San Antonio? LeBron James is probably the fittest person on the planet, still cramped, right? So it can't just be fatigue either. It's more complex than that. And so while Trivia Crack wants to tell you it's salts, I think the real correct answer is actually farther down on the bottom, which is report error. <laughs> Feel free to choose that <laughs> going forward. And so multifactorial theory is something that we put forward very recently in the Journal of Athletic Training just last year. And so I get this question a lot, and this is the holy grail of muscle cramp question. Right? How do I prevent this thing in my athletes in the first place? You told me a lot of stuff that doesn't work, Kevin. Tell me what does work. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> we haven't got that far yet. 
there's a lot more evidence on kind of the pathophysiology part and less evidence on here's how we prevent it, here's how we treat it. That question is easy to solve, right? Stretching. Stretching immediately relieves cramps, yet how much fluid is added to the body by stretching? How many electrolytes are added to the body by stretching? And so if dehydration and electrolyte causes cramping, why does stretching work? To relieve them. Again, disconnect between what we think causes cramping and what actually is used to treat them. And so, like I said, myself and a couple of friends, uh, Susan Jurgen, Brendan McDermott, collaborated on a paper, Martin Schwellness as well was on the paper. Last April, we published a brand new theory for why we think cramps occur. And it's much, much more complicated. Things that consider like pain, prior history of injury, genetic factors, family history, medication use, nutrition, all of these things may play a role in the factors or maybe factors in cramp genesis. And so I like to think of cramping like spaghetti sauce because of course, right? <laughs> so there are like a hundred different varieties of spaghetti sauce. There may be 100 different ways for your athletes to cramp. And so our job is to treat muscle cramping like we would any other injury to an athlete, right? An athlete sprains their ankle, what do we do? Medical history, inspection, palpation, range of motion, special tests. Do you do the same for cramping? If, you're, if we're honest, right, myself included, no. We don't do that, right? We take a shotgun approach. Drink more pickle juice. Drink mustard. Drink antacids. Drink this biochemically altered water in some way, right? Drink more sports drinks. Add salt to sports drinks. We want a shotgun approach to solve cramp, and it's not that simple. What we have to do is our homework. We have to figure out what are our athletes individual extrinsic and intrinsic risk factors that predicated their cramping. So I like to think of cramping like a recipe. Your recipe might be different than my recipe for why I cramp. And so in order to figure out your recipe, I gotta dig into your medical history. I gotta ask you a bunch of questions about why you may have cramped. And the more times you cramp, the more data we get, and then we can start looking for patterns. And so you might cramp when you don't get a good night's sleep, you don't rehydrate fully from the previous day's exercise, and you ran a little harder today than you did last week. And if you only get two of those things, you don't cramp, but you get the third, and now you do. So now it's a perfect storm, a perfect recipe for why you cramped, and that, I think, is a better explanation for all the, di the different observations that we see when athletes come to us and they say they're cramping, right? And so we have to do our homework, we have to look for trends, and if all else fails, try what this guy says. How does your leg feel today? Oh, feeling good. What happened to you? Huh? What happened? Just crap. Just a cramp? Oh, no, just crap. So you told me what, what, what can you eat to help you make you feel better? Bananas. Yeah, why, why bananas? Monkeys never craps. <laughs> you know, monkey never crap. Be because a monkey every day, bananas, two. So how many did you have today? Three, how about three? So you, no, more, no more cramp for you? I need three bananas because a monkey never craps. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much, arigato. Now all you insensitive people are laughing at that poor gentleman. Have you ever seen a monkey cramp? Case closed. Any questions I can answer for anybody on muscle cramping? I like this topic a lot. It's obviously near and dear to my heart, and it lends itself to a lot of fun discussions. Um, if you're curious about pickle juice, and you Google pickle juice research, you're gonna find me. We've done lots of different studies on pickle juice, both how fast it leaves the stomach, how fast we can change sodium concentration in the blood. We've done studies actually on bananas and how quickly we can change potassium concentration in the blood. And if you are curious, and what I would say to our Toronto's Blue Jays uh, baseball player is, it actually takes about 30 minutes to change potassium in the bloodstream if you eat two servings of bananas, which is about three bananas total. It takes 60 minutes to see an appreciable increase in potassium with one serving, which is one and a half bananas. And so again, all of that stuff takes time. You eat it, it goes into your stomach, you gotta break it down, pass it to your small intestines, absorb it in your bloodstream, it takes time. Now what I didn't tell you was we also measured glucose. 
It takes 15 minutes to see an appreciable increase in glucose if you eat bananas. And so how long is your typical halftime? 10 to 15 minutes. If you have your athlete eat bananas, you will deliver a shot of glucose. And if cramping is primarily related to fatigue, or if your athlete's primary risk factor is fatigue alterations in central nervous system activity, you might help them with the banana, not from potassium standpoint, but from a glucose standpoint. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, great talk. This oh, is uh, one that I think probably every AT needs to hear at some point. Um, but I have a question about, I know this is multifactorial. You said cramps could be related to just any number of, of things. Have you ever measured uh, like calcium, you know, in, in the muscle? Because I know I've read and I've also heard and there are some other conditions that are related to muscle contractures based on low levels of calcium. So just curious your thoughts on that. Sure, so it's a great question because calcium is so important for normal muscle contraction, right? If calcium is left within the interstitial fluid space, it binds with our receptors and it causes the overlap of actin and myosin, right? It's super important for muscle contraction. Unfortunately, we have zero data that I'm aware of actually looking at calcium changes in athletes with and without cramping. And what would be really helpful is if we could actually take muscle biopsies of somebody while they're cramping. The downside to that is currently our technology to take muscle biopsies includes obviously sterilizing the area, cutting an incision, forcing somebody to cramp, and then trying to jab them with a sharp needle while their muscle is super rigid. Not possible at the moment, I've tried. <laughs> um, but <laughs> while I would like to say you know, maybe, I like the theory, right? It makes sense to me from a theoretical perspective. We don't tend to lose that much calcium in our sweat. And so everything that we have in our sweat, we also have in our blood because that's where sweat comes from, right? Our, our plasma volume. And so the amount of trace minerals like magnesium, calcium, very small amounts. And so for it to affect cramping, I have my doubts. But I like the idea. Theoretically, it makes a lot of sense. Hey, thank you for speaking today. I've been reading your research for ever since you've been publishing it. Oh, thanks. It's excellent. Um, and thank you for helping to swing the pendulum back to research. Um, with that being said, uh, I think I'd, we'd all like to leave with just what to do. I know, I know you have I've published a lot on stretch, massage, uh, hypersodium replenishment. Um, I've used all of it. In my experience, uh, secondary uh, school setting, most of what I see is early season cramping. That, I think, tends to be more neuromuscular fatigue. They just haven't done enough at game speed. I tend to see that more in my really skilled athletes that can go 80% at practice and still be the best. And then they get game play and they go 100% and they lock up. Um, any insight on that? I'd love to hear. Yeah, so a lot of the data on cramping um, was originally epidemiological in nature. So when do athletes cramp the most? August. And so people would say, well, the reason why they're cramping in August is because that also tends to be the hottest month. Therefore, again, cramping is due to dehydration. But again, as you brought up uh, very succinctly, there's other stuff going on in August besides just people losing large amounts of fluid because it's hot outside, right? Now we have conditioning. People are exercising at higher intensities for longer durations that they're not used to, right? All of your athletes, I'm sure, show up after a summer recess fully conditioned and ready to go into the season. Why are you laughing? Oh, because they don't do that? Yeah, because they don't do that, right? So the first two weeks of practice are like getting your body back into shape. And as a result of that, we also have muscle damage occurring, which causes pain. And there's good evidence to suggest that pain is a factor in cramp genesis. And so you think about this pain, spasm, pain cycle that we talk about breaking in rehab, right? Well, we have athletes that develop cramps in the third quarter. They come off the field, we stretch them, we give them fluids, we break the cramp. Then they go back in the game, right? They run around for a little bit more time and what happens again? They cramp again. And it's this nonstop cycle for the rest of the football game of trying to just get them to the end of the game and we'll worry about you afterwards, right? I didn't show you any of the data for this, but we have data to show from my lab 
just cramping in and of itself. No exercise, no dehydration, no sweat losses, just cramping. People walked into my lab, I asked them, please cramp yourself. Can anybody do that in the room? Is anybody cool like me? Thank you, sir, let's have a drink later. <laughs> we can bond over our mutual experience. I can take my big toe right now and cramp it, right now, very little effort. Right? So we asked people to do that, those people that could, and then we measured how susceptible they were to a second cramp, and guess what happened? The second cramp was easier to induce than the first cramp was. So again, we get stuck in this neurological cycle once cramping occurs because cramping itself changes the neurological system, aside from all of the other factors. So coming back full circle, yeah, it can be a lot of those host things. People are trying to acclimate. They're trying to become conditioned again. As they become conditioned, they become you know, more prone to DOMS, and they have tears in their muscle fibers, which causes pain and swelling and all the other things that may also play a role in cramping. And so one of the things that I'm really proud of, again, check out this article from JAT in April 2021, uh, where we, we talk about the evidence for muscle cramping, the best ways to treat and prevent it. But one of the things I'm really proud of is we put together a table of some very common questions that you can ask your athlete to help you identify those patterns that may be precipitating your athlete's cramping. And it's something like 18 questions that I usually ask people to try and figure out what are your main risk factors. And then you can take those questions and then have your athlete keep what I call a cramp journal. And so anytime they cramp, they write down the answers to those 18 questions and then you look for trends. And then we target that athlete with those specific items. And so again, if it's they're not getting a good night's sleep, now we're gonna start focusing on ways we can help you calm down at night, we can hopefully improve your sleep cycle and hopefully cure your cramping from that perspective. But what I hope you hear from me is that there is no magic cure. It's not pickle juice, it's not hot shot, it's not Gatorade, it's doing your homework. Sorry, usually that's the point where somebody throws a tomato at me because I didn't tell them the answer they wanted. Other questions? Yes, sir. What is the short message to coaches? The short message to pickle juice? To coach, no, to coaches. Oh, to coaches. Get off the dehydration bus. Sorry. Get off the dehydration bus. What is the short message to coaches? And again, I, I know I, I present a lot of evidence that it's not solely dehydration. Again, I think it's a small part. Um, dehydration by itself, I don't think, causes cramping, right? Otherwise, none of you would go outside in Albuquerque. You'll dehydrate yourself. None of you will go to the bar later tonight because alcohol is a diuretic. You'll cramp, right? No. <laughs> Nobody would go in a hot tub if dehydration caused cramping. It's physical work that's necessary for cramping, right? And so the short message to coaches is... We've got educator athletes about what is a safe hydration strategy. We never ever want to fluid restrict athletes from water or sports drinks. I like sports drinks. We know that people will drink more Gatorade than regular water because it tastes better. It's got just as much sugar in it as a Pepsi. Like I have to tell my daughter, no, you can't have a Gatorade, but it's healthier. No. <laughs> Your father studies this. How could you? <laughs> You're out of the will. <laughs> um, but that's the mentality, right? Uh, for years, we would have Gatorade and vending machines in high schools because it was a healthy alternative to soda. And now what we're recognizing is it is not a healthy alternative to soda, and we're taking it out of vending machines. So, Coach, what we got to do is practice safe hydration. So we're gonna measure sweat characteristics or at least body weight in people so we know what's a safe amount to replace. We're gonna keep track of any of the kids that have cramping on a recurrent basis and we're gonna help those people and target them with prevention strategies and then hopefully nip this thing in the bud before it starts. Um, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation, thanks. Oh, um, thank you. But I, I was just curious, you, you mentioned a study where you induced cramping sure. um, in athletes. And, and I was curious, do we know that, you know, like a muscle contraction with electrical stimulation or any of that, do we know that that's the same, that that works the same as a 
muscle cramp? I know you said we can't do, we, it's hard to biopsy a cramping muscle to know, but do we know that that's the same? How dare you, sir, find one of the flaws in my studies? <laughs> no, uh, I was uh, Ken Knight's last PhD student, and so one of the things that Ken uh, taught me that I always try to teach my students too is good research is honest research and transparent research. And what you brought up, sir, is one of the limitations of the research that I do. Now, electrical stimulation-induced cramps, I do not believe are the same thing as exercise-induced cramping. But if I were to just study exercise-induced cramping, I would be spending a lot of wasted time in Michigan at football practice because not a lot of cramps occur, and they're spontaneous and unpredictable. And if you want to get tenure and promoted and all that stuff, you got to publish more than one paper every eight years. So we study cramping with electrical stim because it's very, very reliable and it's very valid. Now, when I look at a cramp electromyogram, like an EMG, and I look at it from an electrically induced standpoint versus an exercise induced standpoint, I cannot tell the difference. Both are high frequency, high amplitude, involuntary contractions that are painful. Now, are there other associated things occurring in an exercise setting? Of course, right? We have changes in metabolites, fluid is moving back and forth between compartments, whereas in my laboratory studies, that tends to be a little bit more consistent because I'm looking for more cause and effect type stuff. And so, is there any research to suggest that electrically induced cramps are the same physiologically as exercise associated cramping? No. But from a EMG standpoint, they look identical. So from that standpoint, I would argue the model itself is pretty good. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, the question was, what was the reference for the most recent JAT paper that I was talking about with all those questions? So I believe the paper was published in April of 2021. So if you do a Google Scholar search for Miller, KC, Jurgen, S, McDermott, B, uh, you should be able to find it. Um, like I said, it was, I believe you can even get the entire article for free right now because JAT doesn't put a lock on that type of information. So it's been out for a year. Like I said, you can use those questions. We also show <laughs> what I also colorfully call like the kitchen sink hypothesis for cramping, right? There are just so many things that contribute. Fancily, I'll tell you it's the multifactorial theory for exercise associated cramping. What colorfully it'd be called the kitchen sink hypothesis because you can make connections. The body is so complex, it's crazy. So look up April 2021 and you should be able to find that paper. And if you can't find that paper, send me an email. Uh, my email is m-i-l-l-e-5-k at cmish.edu and I will send you the paper PDF copy um, for everybody that emails me as well. I think it's something along the lines of an evidence-based Jeez, who writes these titles? <laughs> oh, I did. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly the right article, sir. Yep. Um, so that article is a combination of systematic review as well as me proposing a brand new theory for why cramps occur. Any other final questions? Thoughts? Dr. Craig. Debbie. Dr. Debbie. Whatever, whatever you want to call me, Kevin. Um, I wonder, the only other population that we see um, cramping in really are ill patients. And I wonder what the cor what correlation might be there um, in their conditions versus what our athletes go through as far as any depletion or too much of one thing, not enough of another. So. That's your next study. Yeah, great question. So but I, I think what you said was ill, 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 pati Ill patients, yeah. Yeah, so, so one of the first questions, if you get this article, um, almost every other question in that table you can ask at any interval, but the very first question that I tell people to ask their athlete is, do you have any preceding medical history or medical condition? So we know that cramping is a side effect of a lot of different medical conditions like hypothyroidism, diabetes, Machado Joseph's disease. Cramping is a very vague 
symptom a lot of times of those other injuries. And so the type of cramping that I'm talking about is in healthy, physically active people where the only thing that seems to be wrong with them is that they get cramps. There is a lot of research on nocturnal cramping. So the folks who are over the age of 65 uh, tend to experience nighttime cramping. Nighttime cramping is not the same as exercise associated muscle cramping. We think nocturnal cramping is related to age-induced breakdown of neurons and that that's what causes the cramp at night because while you're sleeping, your central nervous system is off for the most part, right? And so people are in a relaxed, unconscious state and yet their calf cramps or their foot cramps. And so these are neurological conditions. They have to be in order for that to occur during sleep. But that type of cramping is very different than what we see with athletes. Now, there is a, a bit of literature out there with people with like kidney problems that are getting uh, dialysis and where the fluid is moving and their blood is being filtered that they get cramping. And so people will look at that research and say, oh, well, there you go, dehydration causes cramping. But again, that is very, very different than somebody running around on a football field losing sweat. So yes, I would agree with you, cramps are a result of dialysis. I don't think the evidence for athletes suggests cramping is due to dehydration. Great question, though. Let me just say thank you again so much for the invitation to come out. Uh, RMATA is uh, very near and dear to my heart. Thank you guys for the time and attention, and I hope to see you next time, maybe at NATA. Thank you.